Thank you. Uh, before I start into the manufacturing space, uh, let me just um, uh, say a few words to what Emmanuel said. I think uh, I'm just back from India, visited Bangalore, one of the most booming cities in this uh, country, and where we have uh, our second headquarter for Cisco with 13,000 employees. And I learned there, right from the officials there, 600 people are entering the city per day, uh, moving there, want to live there, um, which means, if you sum it up, uh, they need one new school per month, and they need one new hospital per quarter. They are lacking 150,000 doctors, uh, medical doctors in the country, and a lot of them are missing in, um, in Bangalore, and that is, uh, uh, it, it makes it very clear what we need here. We need uh, a lot of uh, IT-based um, uh, medical solutions or healthcare solutions really to support that country. And uh, we have heard a lot now from Orange and from others as well, and uh, yesterday as well from Telcare. And uh, that is a huge market to address and to help. Uh, let me step now into Cisco and what we are doing in the, in the area of IoT, especially in regards to manufacturing. But allow me really to, uh, to explain why IoT is so important for us and what we can contribute as such uh, in the whole space. I want to talk a little bit about the, um, the challenges we are seeing in IoT in the Internet of Things approach and what it means for us in terms of building architectures of the future. And then I'm going into the uh, example of manufacturing, highlighting two uh, customer cases. So let's move to the... Um, Introduction, what's IoT, IOE? So I used, uh, as you see, I'm not only using IoT, Internet of Things, but I'm using another term, which I call IOE. Uh, but we get to that uh, in the explanation of, uh, in, in the next slide. So we believe there is an industrial revolution happening uh, on the one side, and we have talked about it all the time. And uh, after the canals, which have been established a, um, 100 years ago, the railroads, the steam engine, the um, electricity, the internet itself, if, if you would really count it as one of the industrial revolutions, now it is really the internet of things happening. And, uh, but uh, it is not only a revolution in terms of industrial revolution. In our terminology, it is an evolution what is happening, an evolution of the internet. So industrial revolution on the other side, using the internet really to make things happen, to make it more productive, more elegant, etc. On the other side, it's the internet uh, where we are coming from, which is transitioning, which is changing. And for those of you who have looked into the internet 20 years ago, that is when I started with Cisco, it, is all, it was all about connectivity, right? Um, the first web browsers popped up, search started to happen before Google, uh, and it was emailing what we did, right? It was just a client-server type of uh, technology, and most of you probably are familiar with that time. Uh, but this is long ago, and that is just basic in the Internet. Um, then we had the network economy, which is still a very important part of our business, and where a lot of people laughed about when we started with e-commerce, etc. Cisco at that time, about 15 years, 10 years ago, was the biggest e-commerce site worldwide, with more than a million users buying from us uh, online, right? Before all the others started up, right? Um, we are not anymore. We are just leveraging e-commerce as a vehicle, but this was also the start of sales for than others. But it was also an other interesting uh, thing happening. Telephony totally changed towards IP telephony, so traditional proprietary uh, telephony changed to collaboration, to IP-based collaboration. Something similar to what is happening now, you know. When we talk about manufacturing, especially where I get to later, it's all proprietary. And you are moving towards a standard, open, IoT type of scenario in the future. Um, everybody is laughing about it, or some are laughing about it. This will never happen because of a lot of issues we are seeing, which I explain later how we address them. But on the other hand, if you talk to the BMWs, to the VWs and others, they say, okay, the internet is really the way we are going, and production in the car and everywhere, right? If you secure us, if you uh, um, guarantee privacy and other things, but I get to that. Third phase, which we, uh, which we are in now, we call it the immersive experience phase which is characterized by social, social platforms, Facebook, etc., 
by mobility. So we have seen numbers yesterday, the number of mobile devices. Each of us has at least uh, two to three IP-enabled devices which he's using, smartphone, PC, iPad, Android devices, etc. And uh, the number is going to rise to a six or seven in the, in the near future. And we see a lot of our kids who are already using more than three devices in parallel. In parallel. Watching TV is, is, is not really anymore the key thing. They do other things. Cloud, we have, we have heard a lot of stories about cloud. And we believe cloud is playing an essential role, but it will completely change. The cloud as a central cloud, in our view, will disappear because the real-time demands and the requests of our customers are far beyond what a cloud can do. Therefore, we believe the cloud is moving closer, and we call it differently in our, uh, in our terminology, and I will get to that. The cloud is moving closer to the event, to the production line, to the car, because we need real-time, we need it safe, we need it secure, and uh, the cloud in our view, in a, in a traditional way, has some deficits which we need to cope with. Uh, fourth point is video. Everybody of us is using video. Uh, in, in Cisco, 80% now of the traffic in the corporate network is video. Not only playing YouTube videos, but really using it as a, as a communications uh, type of vehicle. And I know from most of the customers, they are above 50% and more. And this is going to rise. So the next uh, phase we are getting into, we call it the Internet of Everything, instead of calling it the Internet of Things. For me, the Internet of Things, we, we, we made a difference now this morning between Internet of Things and M2M. For me, the Internet of Things is M2M. Maybe it's the wrong terminology, based on a different architecture, so it's Internet, I know that. But we believe to make the Internet of Everything happen, it, it needs more than communications between things, right, between machines. It is more about what do we get out of it, and we have talked about it. Uh, it is data, and this data is coming in a, in a huge volume and needs to be reacted on in, in a lot of cases, not in all, I know that. We have examples yesterday seen where it is not the case, but in the manufacturing it has to be reacted in real time. So the data volume needs to be worked on. Processes are behind it. Uh, who are really working on it, analytics, and then it's given to the people who can react, right? So these four cornerstones in our terminology make uh, the e Internet of Everything uh, in, uh, in comparison to the uh, Internet of Things, which in our, our thinking is related to the machine-to-machine -machine or things communications. Um, what does the Internet of Things bring to us? It brings more efficiency, it brings economic value, and it brings quality of life, depending on where we are, where we are looking into. Do we look into the industry, industries? Do we look into uh, the financials? Do we look into the private life, into the smart home or whatever? So there are different um, things we can achieve with the Internet of Things. I want to give one example here, um, which has been done by GE at their Minds and Machines conference they do every year. They evaluated what does it mean using the Internet of Things or everything uh, in um, up-tuning specific industries. So saving of 1% of, uh, in, in fuel consumption, for example, in aviation, by using IT and intelligent censoring, etc., would bring you $30 billion uh, uh, value, which you can leverage for other things, economic value. In the power industry, in the healthcare industry, in rail, in oil and gas, and they have a huge list which is beyond that. That is just within 15 years um, value which you can create in addition if you be more efficient, if you reduce uh, inefficiencies by 1%. That is a very conservative assumption in my view. We will see much bigger impacts. And we have seen a lot of examples already in the, in, the last, uh, in the last day. I think that is a remarkable number. And I will get to uh, some concrete examples later. Sorry that I show that. And we have talked about yesterday. And we know that the Internet of Things is happening. We are at 13 billion devices, smart devices, IP enabled devices, and we, when we say IP-enabled devices, I say IPv4, V6-enabled devices. 
So these are not dumb sensors or dumb devices. These are already intelligent devices if they have an IP address. And they can do more than just sending something in principle. And um, the assumption, and I think Ericsson came up first with it, the 15, 50 billion smart objects in 2020, so in seven years from now, I think it's conservative. We see an adaption which is much uh, faster than that, and it's still five times faster than electricity adaption or telephony adaption in former industrial revolutions. So it's going to happen. Um, if we go to the next slide, then we see there is a lot which we still can connect if you really count objects in this world. And maybe it's a little bit um, making you nervous if you see that, what are these guys talking about? 99% is not connected and you want to connect all of that. You know, we don't know, but uh, there is a potential that things are going to happen. And, uh, and I don't get into the examples of connecting a tree or whatever. There are useful scenarios behind it. And um, we see it all over the place, and we have seen a lot of examples. So there is a huge potential to happen. And we see at the moment the sensor prices, the actuator prices, and all of that, the sync prices are going down rapidly. And uh, in, co in um, contradiction to what I heard this morning, and I get to that later because it has an impact on the architectures of the future, the prices of storage and compute are going down rapidly. The communications prices are not. They are not. And that has a clear implication, not as fast. That has a clear implication in our mind on the cloud versus other types of implementation of the future for the Internet of Things. And I will get to that. Let me jump into opportunities and challenges. Now I get to that. So um, if you look into IoT, and we have talked about that, I think it's a lot about data monetization, and we heard that. And I used a type of a hierarchical approach here, adapting Maslow's hierarchy here for IoT, IOE, and saying, OK, we are coming from a connectivity world, and we are connecti connecting all types of devices and things in the future, but this doesn't help us. This would be pure connectivity. We need to take something out of that, and that this is data. But this also doesn't help us if we don't work on the data. What we did up to now is really analyze the data and got insights into historical data. And, uh, but really, with expert system and intelligence, we can really build a foresight, uh, look into the future, and make assumptions. If we can do this in an automatic uh, way, then we can generate new business models. And uh, I can tell you one thing. I was in the US with the CEO of Continental, manufacturer of tires, and also a supplier to the automotive industry, one of the biggest ones worldwide. And the CEO, Degenhardt, he said, you know, my model at the moment is selling things, tires, electronics, or whatever. In, in 10 years from now, I'm betting 40 to 50% of my revenues are selling data. It's based on selling data. I am gathering 300 megabit per second per car. Um, at the, I could now, and if I would uh, know what I do with it, I would do it now because that is something we need to play back into the car manufacturers, to the, uh, to the officials in the cities to work on this data. That is just one example. They believe their business model is completely changing if they have the, the power and the, the right architecture behind it really to do it, and they will go that way. And they believe the internet is the right way, probably in a slightly modified way. You all know these laws. So Moore's law, technology gets cheaper and more powerful. Uh, Metcalfe's law, maybe for those who are in the communication space or in the networking space, um, with every new um, endpoint, the value of the network or the communications is, um, is increasing or is doubling, right? So exponentially increasing, and uh, so to the square number. So n becomes n square in terms of value of the network. We see that in Facebook and other, in other things. And the third component here, uh, which is highlighted, is big data analytics. And these are things which are describing, in my view, uh, what is really challenge, but also opportunity in IoT. We are going from a, from a data anemic to a data bulimic type of scenario. That means from small data amounts to huge data amounts, which we need to work on and, uh, and play back and, and leverage. We go from insight, historical, to foresight. That is what we need to solve. And we go from slow 
Sometimes it's okay to react slowly on specific scenarios to, to real-time or at least near-time reaction uh, in, in specific industrial areas. And um, now I get to this before I step into the examples, right, if, uh, which I explained before. You know, we have, you know what this device is there on the top? Does anybody know? It's a Raspberry Pi. Check card size type of computer with storage, compute, and communications. 20 bucks, 30, the simple version. This revolutionizes the world. It's, it's originated here in the UK, and it's fantastic. It's just a charity program. You can buy it there, and uh, you can do what you ever want with it. It is a full PC, right? And it's, you can connect it to your television set at home or whatever you want to do. Uh, but that is not the idea behind it. I think it shows that there is a revolution going on, prices going down. It changes uh, the complete adaption of these technologies in the near future. And we see that playing a very important role in the Internet of Things. Um, because it's, it's getting much more scalable, attractive, uh, um, uh, cheap, etc. Beside of the sensors, this device can connect to thousands of sensors and evaluate what is going on. What we see now is storage prices are decreasing most rapidly, followed by computation prices, followed by wide area communications. And in our view, this has a clear implication on the architectures of the future which are capable of handling all different uh, scenarios in the IoT space. Uh, we go in the direction of distributed computing. What does it mean? I, I show it on the next slide. And uh, you know, on the left side, you see the traditional computing model or the traditional networking model. You have a client, you have a server, you have a terminal, you have a mainframe, you have, a, you have your uh, intelligent smartphone going to the web. All of that is one-to-one -one and it's uh, small to big. With, with the requirements in the Internet of Things scenarios and in, in the industry, we are told from different manufacturers, machine builders, also from the transportation customers we have, Deutsche Bahn, uh, Network Rail in the UK and others, guys, I cannot wait, uh, I, I, I cannot really stand the, the light speed latencies, right? This, what you are doing and helping us really to, um, to become really um, real time needs to get closer to the to the real event to the real um, thing happening right so we need to design networks of the future or communication architectures which are different from now they need to get intelligence into the production floor they need to get intelligence out of the data center into a very closer uh, proximity to the real event and that could mean it could be part of a uh, of a network architecture or something additional which you need to bring in. We call it the fog. So going from the cloud to the fog. And the fog is something which is not uh, at, the, um, at the top, but it's closer to the ground. And it's closer to, to where the things are happening. And you know this terminology is now adapted in standardization. And a lot of the uh, manufacturers where we are talking to, are they like that. Uh, they like the idea behind it, maybe not the terminology, we need to think about it, but uh, that is really to make clear, okay, the cloud is getting closer to where it should be, to be uh, secure, to be faster, to be resilient, uh, and to adapt to the growing need of bandwidth, etc. Because we have a bandwidth limit as well. With all the things we are talking about, um, new protocols, lightweight protocols, etc. there is still a bandwidth issue we will get in the IoT space if you don't cope with it. And what we are trying is we bring it into the standardization, into the fora in the US, but also in Europe, and you see most of them here, where we are now stepping in or being part of. Um, so, IoT, IOE in industries, what we are doing is, and sorry for this eye chart, and uh, I jumped through it just to, to, to show to you that we, our focus is not on the B2C, but on the B2B in the first place. We want to really uh, make IoT a valid part of the industry solutions in the factory, in the mines, in oil and gas, in utilities, in the smart cities. We have seen a lot of examples where we are also involved in with smart parking and other things. Um, and um, 
we are also looking into the government space and, and others. Healthcare is missing here. Why is healthcare missing? We know that it, is an, that it is important, but at the moment we have no specific solution developed. These are the solutions which we have developed. And, um, and manufacturing is on the top. If we really uh, count, uh, we have come out with a report together, also with McKinsey Backup and others, which is a, a report on value at stake. That is how we call it. And that is a $14 trillion amount over the next $14 trillion amount over the next 10 years, which is at stake for specific industrial companies if they don't adapt to the Internet of Things uh, activities and uh, gaining efficiency, etc. The whole ecosystem uh, in this world is changing. And uh, the majority of that is happening in manufacturing. So the manufacturing space is the most disrupted space in the next 10 years based on our evaluation, followed by transportation, followed by energy, even more than healthcare. So therefore, we are putting the most efforts in that. Uh, but probably uh, this can adapt and change, and uh, we are listening to our customers to do that. Um, what are we doing uh, to, to, to let you know? We, we can't do that on our own. We know that. Uh, we are not going into the connectivity part on the, on the really wire, on the interfaces itself. And there are different things we learned yesterday. There are traditional things like PLC, 220 megahertz, uh, Wi-Fi stuff, uh, etc. We build it into our products, but we don't develop it in, on our own. And um, we are in the middle, right? We, we see us as an IP connectivity player also in the future, but we do a little bit more than that. Uh, there is a lot of interesting uh, compute activities you do in the architecture of the future, which I described before in the architecture picture, where we want to be in, right? And this can be basic analytics and other things, which we call application en enablement. And on the top, there are again partners which we are working on in several of our um, solutions. If it's electric metering, if it's drain control, street parking, environmental monitoring, just to give you a few examples. Now let me jump into, uh, if we move on, into some examples. Let's look into the, and I have shown that we are following four solutions for in the manufacturing space now. I just highlight one, the connected factory. If you talk really to the production owners at the automotive industry, but also in other machine building environments, they talk to you about asset optimization, faster time to market, a new product introduction, workforce productivity, how can they do it more flexible, safe, etc. How can they train their people, get new skills on board? How do they lower their TCO? And how do they do it secure, secure, secure? By the way, when we're entering the, all these discussion, the main topics, the main concern with the Internet of Things, they're approaching us with is security, right? It's always security. It's security more than safety. It's security because they are afraid and they don't understand the IT security is much ahead of the uh, OT security, I would say, right? And we have a lot of these solutions, but we need to... Um, yeah, we need to educate the OT, the operational industry, uh, technology guys about the IT security, which is playing a very important role in the future in all these scenarios. And if you then look into um, this here, um, we, we, we try to address different pain points with an with a Internet of Things solution for the production floor, for the factory. We want to get away from siloed networks, which are slow. Um, we want to get a... Um, we want to reduce the total cost of ownership by doing that. And that is what we call the converged factory network. Why shouldn't there be several networks? Because they are afraid it's not secure? We, we should show that and we can, right? Uh, there, are, there are definitely threats on uh, safety and security which we can handle with an integrated security solution into the architectures they are building. We can do that. Um, and then there is the topic of mobility, which is playing an important role, where we as an IT company, as an architecture uh, company can help. And uh, fourth bullet point, uh, pain points they are addressing is um, predictive maintenance. Can we build something like a machine as a service for their production areas? And we are working on that, building the solution connected factory. And again, we are not doing it on our own. We are building the middle layer, middle layer 
but we are working with about, just for this solution, we are working with seven, eight companies um, to, to build it for the European, but also worldwide market. Um, don't be afraid, I get to the end very soon. Um, just this here to highlight, for us, our assumption is this market is essential for Cisco to survive in the future, right? Because we are the internet player on the hardware side up to now. If we don't succeed here really to play an important role, where 10 times more ports are available than in the um, traditional environment where the internet is popped up or booted up in the enterprise, then we will uh, not play an important role in the future. So for us it is important uh, to be in this market and it's a huge potential for Cisco and for all other players going into the infrastructure. One final example before I get to the conclusion is on the uh, car. Uh, manufacturer side, Audi as an example, and Mr. Stadler, the CEO from Audi, said, okay, 10 years ago we were thinking about how can we connect all the things in the car together. Um, they didn't, they, they succeeded, but they succeeded with about five to six proprietary bus systems per car. Entertainment control system, lighting, and whatever they do, right? All on different type of uh, systems. If you talk to him now, he's clearly saying, okay, it is going in one direction, and this direction is deterministic Ethernet IP-based, in the car and also to the outside. There is a clear reference model which is going IP-enabled uh, IP and Ethernet-enabled in a car, which is really a sensitive device, right? So we do that there. The same is in the train industry, the signaling in the stations, in the network of the uh, transportation railway companies is moving towards IP and Ethernet. So that is going to happen. Uh, one other statement here um, from Mr. Degenhardt from Conti. He is saying a car uh, has eyes like a, like a human being. He, it, it can look 200 to 300 meters. So if you don't build a, if you want to make the, the car industry changing and wa walking towards a, for example, driverless community in the future, uh, then you need to enable the things around it, right? So communication with the streets, with the lighting, with other cars, with a, back, with a backbone which is internet-based, right? Just one example, he said 50 kilometers per hour, um, if the cars wouldn't drive faster than 50 kilometers per hour now, we could, uh, equi we, we could make all cars driverless now. Now without doing any accidents. In, in 10 years from now, we will have uh, the possibility, technology-based, to go to 100 kilometers per hour. I think that is, I told him, probably that is, a, that is not good enough, because in Germany, nobody would like it. We want to drive faster than 100 kilometers per hour. So it's, it, it will fail. No driverless cars in Germany. So having said that, um, I just want to invite you to this here. We have understood Manufacturing, transportation, and a lot of industries are going to happen in Europe and, and not in the US in the first place. There is a clear world market leadership on, in a lot of industries here in, in Europe, and therefore we decided to move to Berlin as a, um, as, a, um, as a city where we want to implement a center of innovation now, where we are focusing on building solutions for the manufacturing, transportation, and energy sector worldwide. So Cisco is, is going here and uh, doing a lot of research and development work. And I can invite all of you to join us because this will be an open uh, environment, uh, inviting partners really to work with us on our open platforms. Thanks for listening and um, I hope I kept the time nearly. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much.